So um, to begin, I want to um, call your attention to a study that appeared now almost a decade ago. And it's a study that in, let's say, recent times kind of relaunched the interest in um, meditation from the perspective of cognitive neuroscience. And it was a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It came from Richie Davidson's lab at uh, Wisconsin-Madison, and Antoine Lutz was the lead investigators. And as the title says, what they found is that highly experienced practitioners of Tibetan Buddhist meditation, all of them monks, brought about very um, interesting and dramatic uh, patterns of brain activity as seen in surface EEG recordings. So the patterns were these compared to, uh, compared to the controls where you have very, very high amplitude or high power, fast frequency oscillations in the gamma band. So this is roughly 25 to 42 cycles a second. Plus, in addition, a phase synchrony relationship among multiple electrode sites where these high amplitude oscillations are, are in synchrony, in phase with each other within a given window of time. And this is standardly taken as a kind of um, signature of this large scale integration or global workspace type of phenomenon that, that Neil was talking about. So what they found is that when the meditators we're in a 30 second resting state and then a 60 second meditation state, 30 second resting state, 60 second meditation state, that in the meditation state you had this burst of the high frequency gamma activity with the emergence of a particular pattern of distributed phase synchrony on the scalp. Now, um, I, I emphasize the self-induce in the title because I'm, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But one of the things that in the course of this investigation they found just informally talking to the Tibetan Buddhist monks is they said, well, it's not as if we just go into the meditation state automatically. It takes some time to actually generate it. And um, the, the question was asked, well, well how do, exactly what does that feel like? How do you know that you're generating the state? And they said, well, it increases and decreases in clarity over this particular period of time. And clarity is a term that we use in our sort of native theoretical and phenomenological vocabulary to describe the, the felt vividness of the state. And this changes and um, you sort of know that you're in the state because you're kind of tracking this increase in the clarity. And the scientist said, oh, well, could you actually report that? Could you, could you um, report that on a, on a rating scale? And they said, well, sure, we could do that. So what they did is they asked them to rate on a one to nine scale increases and decreases in what they called clarity. And they found that it, incre that it correlated with increases and decreases in the amplitude of the gamma activity. So now what I want to emphasize here is first of all that this came about through a kind of informal discussion about what it was like to do the meditation. So in a sense it was a kind of informal phenomenology. But then it turned out that that phenomenology could actually be made somewhat rigorous for the purposes of the investigation and that on the one hand and this would be the sort of standard way we would look at it from a kind of cognitive science perspective, we'd say, oh, so the self-report is actually corroborated because there's an objective biobehavioral measure that shows that, okay, so when they say something's going on, they're actually really tracking something that's going on. That would be the standard way to look at it, and I think that's a perfectly valid way to look at it. But there's another way to look at it, equally important, I think, which is to say that the self-report provides a kind of um, window into phenomenology. It provides phenomenological information. And without that phenomenological information, these changes in the signal would just be noise. They wouldn't particularly mean anything. So you're recovering information from the signal by making use in a rigorous way of the first person perspective and the expertise that, in this case, inhabits that perspective. So that's the, that's the, 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 the sense in which it's a neurophenomenology, is that the phenomenology is actually being mobilized in a, in, a, um, in a rigorous way. Now, of course, there's a history of this in psychology going back to psychophysics, but I think this is interesting because the kind of skill in this case is a skill at generating and maintaining endogenously, you could say, certain kinds of mental states that's, in this case, um, highly trained. Now, I emphasize the word self-induce in the title. And I want to connect that to some of the discussions we were having yesterday about mental causation. And um, I made the point that 
you know, we talk about affecting the mind via the brain, where the idea is that we perform some manipulation on the brain and we see a resulting change at the level of the mental states. But I also want to say that it goes the other way, that by changing your mental state, you change what your brain is doing. So now, when we put it that way, all of a sudden questions about dualism arise. Well, are you thinking the mind is something, you know, that's sort of hovering above the brain and the body that's kind of intervening downwards? Like, what exactly do you mean? So what I would like to do is I would like to propose that we think about it this way. And this is to, to make use of a notion that comes from the philosophy of science, a certain way of thinking about causation that's called the interventionist approach. So on this way of thinking about causation, if we say that X is a cause of Y, what we mean is that intervening on X is a way of intervening on Y. We affect Y by performing a certain intervention or manipulation on X. So if we think about that in, in, the, in the, say, cognitive neuroscience context, we know that intervening on a lower level, so lower here could mean the level of a neuron or a molecular level, so a lower in the sense of micro, um, if we intervene through transcranial magnetic stimulation or, or direct cortical electrical stimulation or drugs or whatever it might be, we know that those interventions have effects mentally. At the same time though, we can say that intervention, interventions at a higher level or we might say at a personal level rather than a subpersonal level, there's different ways we might want to put this, we know that that can bring about lower level effects. And all of our experiments in cognitive neuroscience depend on this fact. Because we put someone in a scanner and say, okay, here's your instructions. This is what I want you to do. And we presume they understand the instructions. And what we might want them to do is to selectively attend to something or to generate a mental image. So all of that is the entire vocabulary and conceptual framework for expressing that is psychological. So the point would be that interventions at a psychological level can bring about neural effects. And I think this formulation allows us to say in a perfectly coherent way and without dualism that changing one's mind affects one's brain. That is to say those kinds of changes, mental changes, provide a distinct way of psychologically intervening on neurobiological processes. And we don't need the meditation example to make this point, but it's a useful example because it's so striking in that it's, it's not task driven from the outside. It's endogenously arising. Now I think this kind of approach to causation is really useful when we start dealing with more complex situations involving, for example, real-time fMRI feedback where you're in the scanner and you're getting in real-time feedback about the activity in a particular region or maybe correlated activity between regions. So this is a study that, um, that I contributed to that, that comes from Judd Brewer's lab in Yale. And what they did is they used real-time fMRI in um, a situation where they compared individuals with meditation training and non-meditation training with focused attention, focused attention tasks. And I don't have time to go through the whole study, but I'll just underline something from the abstract, which is that when participants were instructed to volitionally decrease the feedback graph. So this is like a, a, a bar graph showing increases and decreases in activity from a particular region, in this case the posterior cingulate cortex. The meditators, but not the non-meditators, showed significant de deactivation in the PCC. And then this was in a situation where they knew what the graph meant. And then this was replicated in another group of participant uh, meditators who didn't know in advance about the relationship between um, what was going on experientially as, as, as they were um, experiencing it and reporting it and the, the feedback graph which was um, uh, reflecting again activity in the posterior cingulate cortex and the, um, the instructions involved them shifting between a focused attention to the breath and a, a more open mind wandering situation. So the point I want to emphasize here is that this interventionist way of thinking about causation I think is really useful for making sense of these tangled situations where subjects are now actually phenomenologically um, altering in real time what they're doing by being given information about what their brain in real time is doing and by the same token actually changing what their brain is doing by virtue of engaging in these, um, these mental practices. So to, um, to wrap up then, 
for me, neurophenomenology is a kind of circulation among um, multiple things. And I'm emphasizing meditation in this case because I think it's a very interesting case, but you know, there could be other things in there as well, the kind of training that comes from dance, for example, which is very much a, a kind of, I mean, it's a mind-body training. So we're interested in, let's say, the phenomenology of consciousness, and one window on that is the um, ability to make more precise reports that comes with certain kinds of training. We want to have a neuroscience, or actually really a cognitive science window on that, so we don't want to just take that for granted. We want to investigate that phenomenon itself, and we want that to be informing our investigation of, of consciousness in, in cognitive neuroscience. So this is then, I think, a vision of what I would call a kind of um, complex circulation among multiple domains where none of, none of them is reducible to the other. They're all um, integrated, uh, necessarily integrated in a, in a larger constellation. So just to indicate by way of ending where this is now as a, a research program would be to say that the first steps would be to in experimental situations use participants who have some kind of training of the sort that I've been talking about who are able to give first-person reports on a trial-to-trial -trial basis. This is important because it connects to, to Sarah's point about averaging yesterday, is that for this kind of work, it's very interesting to see how experience fluctuates from moment to moment without averaging across the trials. Because when you average across the trials, by definition, you wipe out the variability. But the variability is actually something we're interested in now. But it's really hard to get at variability when you ask your usual college undergraduate to make a report about what they're doing. They don't really have that mental, um, not to disparage undergraduates, but they don't typically have the kind of mental competence for that that comes from, say, years of experience of meditation practice. So we want first-person reports on a trial-to-trial -trial basis in conjunction with what I would call second-person methods for explicating tacit experience. Because in the case of, say, Tibetan Buddhist meditators, we're dealing with individuals from another culture, and the vocabulary is different, the phenomenological framework is different, and they, they have an expertise clearly, but they might or might not be, depending on the individual, good at explicating that expertise in a way that would be important for science. So we need to work with a kind of second person, you know, cl almost clinical interviewing type of work to explicate um, what it is that they're, they're doing. And then in experimental protocols where the point is not simply to research meditation as a special thing, that's in a way, at least from my perspective, not so interesting. It's more interesting to use this approach to address basic questions about cognitive functions and consciousness, questions about mind wandering or cognitive control or selective attention. And then of course, if we want to have a biobehavioral perspective on this as we do, then that's where the repertoire of, of modern cognitive neuroscience comes into play and in the case of this kind of work, what's, what's, it's not exclusive, but what's particularly important is this large-scale distributed activity, the network activity that we look at in EEG or, or fMRI to, to try to characterize the shifting network dynamics that, that underpins this because there's, there's really lots of evidence that says that that's really, um, in some ways, the, the, the crucial level for investigating this. Not to say that, again, other levels such as a molecular level aren't um, as well. Thank you.